been a pleasure to introduce the next talk. It's about common mistakes you do um, with database definitions, I guess. And I don't know how many times I screwed up those. <laughs> I guess the customers are in the other talk, but yeah, they still have open tickets because I missed some indices on database columns. Yeah, <laughs> but anyways. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Dejas Kumar can't be with us today, but he pre-recorded his talk, and uh, we will just stream it here. And he, he's not available for t uh, questions afterwards, but if you have any further questions, we are very happy to um, relay them to him. And yeah, I think let's watch the talk. Have fun. What's up, everybody? I'm so glad uh, to see you here again, and, and I'm really excited to talk to you about some interesting things. Uh, let's, let's get to it. So, hi, my name is uh, Tejas. That's pronounced like advantageous. So whether or not I'm advantageous, we'll find out. Um, and I am the Director of Developer Relations at Zeta. At Zeta, we're just really trying to make um, databases easy. We're trying to give databases the love they deserve and give developers, web developers, the best developer experience they can possibly have with databases. That's like our whole thing. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Today we're here to talk about database complexity. Um, and, and really, I'm excited for this. It's going to be maybe a bit longer, but let's, let's see how we go. Um, before we get into it, I do want to talk about the, the motivation that, that went into this. Um, and that motivation was supplied at a conference that I was recently at. I was recently at React Miami. Um, shout out. And there was this amazing speaker. His name is Swix, uh, or Sean Wang. He was the director of developer relations, uh, so my job, but at a company called Temporal. Um, and he had this amazing slide about you know, full stack developers, a meme, if you will. Um, and it essentially talked about how full stack developers usually are amazing on one side of the stack, but kind of okay on the other. Um, I called myself a full stack developer. I'm no exception to this. Um, and, and he had this amazing diagram of this beautiful front end and a so-so back end. Here, have a look. Uh, this, is, this is what it looks like. So this was his talk. It was a great talk. I think it's on YouTube. You should check it out. Um, but look at, the, look at this. Um, that, is a, that is a full stack developer, right? And I thought this was really funny. And that's really the motivation for this, right? Is, is some of us feel like imposters in the database space. Imposter syndrome is a real thing. Like I hear a lot of people talking about like DynamoDB, Mongo Atlas, and and SQL and Schema List, and I, like sometimes the imposter syndrome comes up. And here's what I'm here to say today: uh, Let's fix this. Maybe this doesn't need to be the case. So what I'd like to talk about in in our time together is four hard problems that databases experience that usually um, need to be solved anyway. And and the the hope is that I, I spend enough time talking about databases and, and these things using the terminology that you know we leave here with a bit more confidence in the area th than, than we walked in with. That's really my goal. Um, I will reference products. I'll probably use Redis and geek out at like, wow, how amazing is Redis? Um, but that's, that's secondary, okay? So with that, let's get into it. What are the top four problems we see um, in databases? Here, I'm just typing a bit. Right, so problems, um, number one, is analysis paralysis. What does that mean? It means we take way too long to do anything and, and we try to be too careful and then we end up doing nothing. And we'll, we'll dive deeper into some of these over time. Um, but for now, it's analysis paralysis, um, it, it's kind of what it sounds like. Number two, scale. How do you scale? How do you replicate? What does that mean? Should I use SQL? Should I use NoSQL? We'll talk about that. Number three, um, data infrastructure. So it's not just about databases, but what we do with them. Oftentimes, databases need some type of caching, need some type of um, search engine. Need, so there's a whole landscape that, that I think uh, we deserve to talk about. And then third is migrations. I, I feel like it would be you know, uh, kind of a, an incomplete talk about database problems without mentioning migrations are probably the most problematic thing about databases. Um, so with that, let's just break these down quickly and get straight into it. Uh, thing number one is analysis paralysis. What does that mean? Um, analysis paralysis has a, co a common understanding that, you know, you sometimes get way too nervous to do things or you think way too much and then you end up doing nothing. You get paralyzed by analyzing. Um, this, this happens around a number of questions, um, two of which are, number one, do we go managed or self-hosted? 
managed or self-hosted. We'll talk about what that means and the trade-offs between them. And number two, SQL or no SQL. Uh, same thing. If you're not familiar with this, just stick around. We'll, we'll become comfortable. We'll talk about them. We'll understand a bit better. Uh, let's start with managed or self-hosted. What, is, what does managed mean? Um, kind of what it sounds like. So a managed database is a database that somebody else owns that essentially you rent um, and use for a fee. Most of the modern web anyway runs this way. Netflix um, stores a lot of stuff on other people's databases as far as I know. Um, a lot of the web runs on one particular cloud provider that is Amazon Web Services or AWS and like it's nuts. A lot of people pay them to rent their stuff. Um, and so that is a managed database. Somebody else owns, creates, operates, maintains the database for you, and you pay them a little something. Usually what you pay them even is relative to your company's size and your usage. So if you use like 100 gigabytes, you pay for 100 gigabytes. If you use one kilobyte, you pay for one kilobyte. It's quite cool in that it, it can meet everybody where they're at. Uh, that's it's managed. Let's talk about the other one. Let's talk about self-hosted. What is self-hosted? The opposite of managed. Um, instead of somebody else hosting your stuff and you paying them, you do everything yourself. So let's talk about now the, the trade-offs between these two, the pros and cons. We'll start with managed. Um, number one, I mean, you save on hiring. Like you, salaries are high. Maintenance costs are high. You, you save on like hiring a database administrator and so on. Like Amazon or Microsoft or any other company in the cloud has their own DBAs, database administrators. They pay them the salaries and you just use a chunk of their work anyway, so you don't need to pay for that. You, you save on salaries. Number two, um, it's reliable and available. Like you sign an agreement usually, an agreement that it'll work the way you expect. They, they will service you within a certain amount of time called an SLA. Um, there's a lot of agreements you sign that say, hey, this is going to work reliably a certain percentage of the time. And if not, you know, you can get a refund, you get reimbursements, you can sue, like there's options, um, which is quite nice as a customer. Number three, variety. Like there's so many of, of these databases, managed databases around. Uh, I work for one, but there's Cosmos DB, DynamoDB, FaunaDB, EdgeDB, like there's tons, right? And um, you, it's really the, the choice of the person. Um, we, we, Zada doesn't really um, have an opinion there. We think we give the best developer experience, but it's up to the, the people's choice. That's pretty cool. Um, what are some cons of, of managed? Number one, less control because it's somebody else's, somebody else's computer. Your, your, your thing is in somebody else's house. So you can't do whatever you want with it. You can't like go poke holes, you can't take it apart. You can't add more RAM when you want, uh, physically anyway. Um, you just have less control. You, you, it's not truly yours. Um, number two, privacy concerns. If, if I'm building like a medical app um, and I store like how many stem cells people have, I don't even know if that's a thing, but like if I store sensitive data, um, even if they say they're not looking at it, there's no way to know, no. Maybe I'm just a conspiracy theorist, I don't know. But like, I would feel much more comfortable about data privacy if I physically owned the thing in my house. So, you know, uh, I, that's I think something to be considered of. Number three, vendor lock-in. So um, what that means is as you grow with something like AWS or Amazon Web Services and they host your database, your database might get so big that you cannot break away from them and do your own thing. If you want to move from managed to self-hosted, it may prove really hard because it's just too big to move. Uh, vendor lock-in is, is dangerous. And there's a lot of companies trying to mitigate this. Like at Zeta, we, we try to make it really easy to take your data somewhere else if you want, but not everybody. And so it's a real risk. Let's talk about self-hosted pros and cons. Uh, what is uh, number one pro of self-hosted? More control. Like there's a difference between you know, sleeping on your friend's couch and living on your friend's couch and living in your own house. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so it's self-hosted. You're living in your own house. You can do whatever you want. It's the wild west. You can just change the chat, change the housing, everything. Like, go nuts. It's pretty cool. Uh, number two, bespoke security. It kind of ties into more control because you can do whatever you want because you have this machine. Uh, you can add as many or as few security measures as you want. You can allocate other resources for other things you can really do custom stuff, which is quite cool. Um, number three, there is no lock-in. 
like what vendor are you going to lock in here yourself like it, it so it's quite nice to be free and, and not tied down to some for-profit capitalist machine cons it is harder to scale in in amazon web in aws i can say i want this machine to go from eight gigabytes to 80 gigabytes click a button it happens scale at least vertical scale um if i want to add disk space to a physical machine i own i need to take it apart insert a disk it's just harder it's harder uh and that's that's one of the trade-offs number two um it's resource intensive by resource i mean like you know every kind it's going to consume your electricity it's going to consume your energy it's just expensive um and and, and not the best for that number three I said expensive already, but it's also expensive in terms of money. Now, if you self-host, there's probably a good chance you're going to hire someone to do the job, right? And and you have to pay them. Guess how much a database administrator earns? Too much. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, but but it's it's going to be more expensive if you if you self-host for sure because of that. And also then scaling and your costs. Those costs are borne bore bear bared by um, AWS and others in this case. So. Those are the trade-offs between SQL and NoSQL, uh, sorry, between managed and self-hosted. I'm getting ahead of myself. But what is, you might be thinking, what is my preference in this? What do I choose? Um, I'm a bit biased, but my preference, as usual, is to go with managed. Because, look, if, I, I grew up in Qatar, okay? Uh, if a light bulb was broken, I don't fix it myself. There's someone I can pay to do it. I know it sounds crass. It's a culture I grew up in. I'm not proud of it, necessarily. It's just how it was. Um, so any opportunity for me to pay for simplicity, I'll, I'll do it. Um, but also, like if, if, if there's a hackathon, okay, and I need to build like a Tinder clone uh, in 10 hours, I would rather spend all the time working on my Twitter clone instead of like the first six hours figuring out, oh, it's a database machine, how do I set it up? How do I provision it? How do I scale it? Like, I don't, I don't care. I, I wanna focus on my product and not on a database. So I would, I would choose managed every single time. Let's move on. Um, next analysis paralysis question. SQL or no SQL? This is not uh, Shakespeare, by the way. This is just two technologies. And I need to clarify, actually, before we continue that, that they sound similar, but they are fundamentally different. And we'll get into it more over time. But before we get into the SQL or no SQL debate, we need to consider another thing, uh, which is called CAP theorem. It's CAP. CAP theorem. Um, CAP theorem states that, posits that, um, that you can have, by the way, CAP is an acronym for consistency, availability, partition tolerance. And CAP theorem says you can have only two of them. Um, you can have only two of them. So let's, let's define the three of them and then look at why you can have only two of them. Okay. So let's start. Consistency. What does that mean? That means at any given time, your data is accurate. Your data is accurate. Um, consistency. Availability. At any given time, if I send a request for data, I get a response. I do not get a long wait time. I do not get a timeout. I do not get a failed request. Um, partition tolerance. So in a distributed system, meaning multiple computers, when a computer communicates with another and there's packet loss and the connection is interrupted, Partition tolerance, that is called a partition, by the way, an interrupted connection between nodes. So partition tolerance means that even if something like that happens, the connection will work and I'll get my data. It tolerates the partition between systems, the, the severance in a connection, if you will. Okay. So uh, CAP theorem says you can have two of them. Let's, let's look at why and how that works. So let's assume we get just availability and partition tolerance. This is the setup for almost every big database in the world. Every, every big company that has scaled databases will have to settle for an AP, uh, CAP theorem style database, because consistency is going to suffer. Let, let's, let's, look, let's examine this closely. So say you have partitions, meaning you have multiple computers. So you have a huge database at scale, right? There's maybe it's SQL, maybe it's no SQL, whatever, but your database is spread out across many servers, across many computers. Now, um, your, your database is going to receive a request for data and that request might be routed to one computer in this cluster that does not have the latest data, but is under the lightest load. As a result, it will serve stale data. Um, 
and there your consistency suffers. It's available, so it serves something. Um, any uh, communication between nodes that goes wrong is going to succeed with partition tolerance, but your consistency will suffer. This is very common. Um, let's look at what happens if we don't have availability, but we have consistency and partition tolerance. Uh, so if, if, if the data is for sure consistent, and if communication between nodes works, what's going to happen is availability will suffer. Why? Because of something called replication lag. So as data is replicating across like hundreds of different computers, you have to wait for the data to be consistent across all of them. You have to wait for them to have consensus of, of accurate data. That delay means availability is not going to be immediate or even at all. Um, in some cases, it might just time out because it's waiting too long, right? So that's, that's how you don't get the availability piece. Lastly, let's look at how you don't have the partition. This, this to be fair, is quite rare, um, if I'm being honest, because like you always have, like to not have partition tolerance is to not have a distributed system. At least, if, I, if I'm wrong, correct me. But um, how you can end up in a situation where you have consistency and availability, but no partition tolerance. Again, no partition tolerance meaning messages between computers, connections between computers are severed, and, and that's it, your connection dies, right? Um, how you can still have this is if you don't have multiple computers. Like if you have a very small one node SQL server um, or no SQL, whatever, if you, have, if you have no partition, if you have no distributed systems, then you send a request, data is going to be consistent because there is no replication and replication lag, and it's going to be available because it's a server but you don't get partition tolerance because you don't have multiple nodes, right? So this is, this is kind of how um, CAP theorem works. And this is important to understand as we talk about SQL or NoSQL because by design, these systems facilitate these things. What does that mean? Let's talk about it. So let's start with SQL. Now what I want to do is talk about the trade-offs, the pros and cons with uh, SQL. We'll start right, right off the bat. SQL gives you structure. Gives you structure. Like SQL is opinionated. You need to have tables Tables need to have columns, and columns have rows. Like, that is structure. Uh, SQL also allows you to r relate one table to another and say this field responds to, corresponds to that field and so on. SQL allows you a lot of structure. Number two, um, SQL is a f it gives you a familiar language of interacting with your data. I think many of us even learn SQL in school. Um, structured query language. I really hope the S stands for structured and not something else, standardized query language. Anyway, um, it's a way to interact with your data. You can select, update, delete, um, insert. It's, it's, it's semantic and it's good and it's more or less standardized and unified such that if you work with any special flavor of SQL, Postgres, MySQL, whatever, you'll kind of find your C legs. So it's quite valuable that way. Uh, number three, acid guarantees was that? <laughs> uh, we need to go down a bit deeper into a rabbit trail and talk about this. ACID. What is ACID? ACID is a backronym, like CAP, it stands for Atomicity, Consistency, Isolation, Durability. These, these guarantees, you get them with, with a single SQL Server database. Um, and let's talk briefly about what these are. Atomicity. Atomicity states that so when you do stuff on a SQL server, you, you do it through statements, SQL statements. Select star from something, that is a statement. A transaction is a collection of statements. Um, atomicity, the guarantee of atomicity states that in a given transaction, either all statements execute um, and then the database is changed if there's an update or none of them execute and then nothing is changed. But in a scenario where like, half of the statements work successfully and half don't, um, the transaction is, is rolled back and nothing is committed. And this gives you a lot of safety with these atomic transactions, right? Because you, you know then either something is going to work or something is not, but your database is never in some mixed Frankenstein state. That is an amazing guarantee for safety. Let's move on. Consistency. Consistency, we, we talked about it. At any given time, before transaction, after a transaction, the data you get back is accurate. Um, number three, isolation. Transactions happen without knowledge of each other. So if, if you're a software engineer, you kind of have a cringy reaction to coupling. Systems should not couple. Why? Because then you break one, you break the other. 
right? It's similar with assets. So when, when you do transactions, when you work with your uh, SQL databases, you have the guarantee of isolation, meaning queries run separately and one will not affect the other. Again, it, it's a great safety measure. And, and lastly, durability. What that means is um, when a transaction is committed, then the data is persisted and always exists. Uh, and this, this is quite cool because the difference, the difference here is a difference to like a, a key value store or something that's in memory. When something is in memory, when you close the process or shut down your computer or something, the data is lost because it's in, in, in memory. It's not saved to a persistent medium like a disk. Um, so durability says that when a transaction is committed, um, it's on disk and you can turn off your database and the data is still there and it will always be there until you decide to delete it. And even that delete transaction is going to be stored forever. Um, so ACID guarantees. Um, hopefully we understand that now and we can come back and look at the pros and cons a bit more. So what are some cons of SQL? Number one, hardware costs. Uh, expensive. Because with SQL, usually you have one server um, and then when it gets a lot of load, you, you scale it up. You're like, oh, I, I need more RAM. I need more disk space. I need to add a solid state drive. All of these hardware components are expensive. Uh, it would be much cheaper another way. Number two, normalization. What is normalization and why is it a con? I thought this was a good thing. Uh, let's talk about that. So normalization, we'll, we'll talk about that after the, the, the next con, which is rigidity. Um, my slides are weird. Whoa, something weird is happening. Look at that. Um, anyway, all right. Okay, rigidity was the last con. I'm not going back because it's too painful. But rigidity um, states that you have a rigid structure. Tables, call, we talked about this already. Um, structure and rigidity are kind of similar, but it's rigid and it's a con here because sometimes it's just easier. You don't know the structure of your data like from the get-go. You want to just say, I don't know, like I, I have a user's table and I just have name and email. You don't know um, that you will need a photo URL until later. So th that flexibility is not there. Instead, it's, it's more of a con of rigidity. All right, back to the slides. Let's talk about normalization. What is normalization? Normalization is a way in which we can reduce redundancy so repetition of, of data, and a way in which we can use data more intelligently in SQL databases uh, to help us really get the most out of them. Normalization is standardized in what are called normal forms, abbreviated with NF, and there's five of them. So there's 1NF, first normal form, 2NF, second normal form, 3NF, third normal form, and of course, what do you think is next? Guess, what, what, what do you think? Of course, what's next is BCNF 3.5 normal. Come on. Uh, Boyce COD normal form or 3.5 normal form, uh, 4NF, fourth normal form, and 5NF. Um, what do these mean? Look, we don't have as much time, so I probably won't get into the nitty gritty of all of them, but I do want to highlight for sure the first normal form because it is the foundation. Like if your database doesn't comply to 1NF, you have problems. Okay, uh, so let's spend some time on 1NF and we'll briefly touch on the others, but not too much. Um, so what is 1NF? 1NF has some requirements. These requirements are, number one, cell values are atomic, meaning you have a single value in a cell, not like this comma that comma that comma that, okay? Number two, columns are strongly typed, meaning you can't have a column that has a number and text in it at different rows, it's weird. Number three, Column names are distinct. So imagine a scenario where you forget to disambiguate. You have a, a table with three columns, name, email address, name. And one of the names is first name, the other name is last name, but you know you just chose because you like chaos. Column one is called name, email, and then name. You have two columns of the same name. Can you see how this would be problematic? So one and F says, no, 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 column names have to be different for sanity for redundancy reduction as well. All right, number four, um, order of data is relevant. And that is, if for your data to be 1NF, it, it doesn't need to be ordered. In fact, 1NF says embrace the unorderedness. Why? Because SQL has order by where you can order stuff. It, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay, so with that, um, let's now look at maybe a demo of this. I'd love to show you um, here on my screen what this looks like. So we have a, we have a table here, it's called bad table. <laughs> Um, and this, is, this table does not conform to any NF, so let's look at why. 
Uh, for starters, we have this favorite number. Um, this type is sometimes a number, sometimes text. That's a bit weird. Um, we can fix this by deleting the column and we'll make another column and we'll call it, um, we'll, this, this one is an integer column. It's not a string column, that's important, right? We'll call it favnum, John favnum, great actor. Um, and now we can do one, two, three, four. But look, notice if we try to enter some text here, there's, there's validations. Uh, we're protected and one and F is kind of enforced, which is a good thing. Um, okay, second problem with one and F is this. Look, this is supposed to be atomic. Pets is supposed to have one value, but there's two. How can we fix this? Um, what we can do is remove the collection here and we'll just add another one with some of the same values. It, it's fine to have some of the same values because in the end, the whole row is, is not the same thing. So he had a snail, I believe. It's a reptile, 50, 20 unread emails and favorite number is 10, I don't know. So there, so now this actually does conform uh, to, to one and F, it's quite cool. Good, this is one and F. Let's, let's continue with the presentation. Um, and what we'll see is, let me get my things in order. What we'll see is this is 1NF. It's, it's been defined already, so no definition. But now we can see based on 1NF, all the other things follow. So 2NF, as we see here, is, is 1NF, but no partial dependency. What is a partial dependency? We, we need to come back to the laptop for this. So um, in, a, in a given database, in a given table, um, there's something called keys. A key is how you identify a given row. Um, in this table, for example, this ID is, is what is called the primary key. You would, by ID, you would get and, and delete stuff by ID. You wouldn't like delete the row with name uh, Tarun because Tarun could, there could be like 50 Taruns here, then you delete everyone. So you use this one because it's a unique identifier and it is the primary key. So you delete the row with this ID instead. Um, and this also helps then any related tables follow in a cascading delete and so on. Anyway, why am I telling you this? Um, a dependency is a dependency on this, on, on the primary value. Um, so, or at least it should be. So name depends on ID. Email depends, all of these other columns depend on that one. That is a dependency. Um, so what does 2NF mean with no partial dependency? Okay, so if now what you can have in SQL what we just talked about, that, that ID column being the, the primary key, you can have a primary key with more than one column. You can say, let's, let's go back to the laptop actually, you can say, instead of ID being the column, dream with me, uh, we, we, let's pretend our table looks like this, and name and email are a joined primary column, okay? Uh, this table violates 2NF if, because of this, uh, this, this, this column here, unread email count, it is a partial dependency, meaning it depends only on the email address and not on the name. It doesn't care about the name. That partial dependency violates 2NF in this table. So how would we fix it? We would have a new table, emails, with an address, unread count, and we would link the user table, which this is, to the emails. Um, we can actually maybe do that. So let, let's, here, let's, let's try to do that. So we'll create a new table, we'll call it emails. Um, and, and what we'll do is we'll add some columns when the, when the cold start happens, um, and we'll call this one, we'll call it, yeah, this, this, this is an email here, and um, count, right, unread count, and what we'll do is um, we'll add a link to the first table, bad table, we'll call it user, awesome. So now, to, to implement 2NF, look, we have two tables. If we go back to bad table, um, we can actually delete this unread email count business. Delete the column. Um, it's nonsensical values anyway. And we can even delete the email, but we'd have to create emails there. So let's just, for, for, for the demo sake, we'll create just one. Um, so we'll delete this column, okay. And we'll add an email for me. So we'll add a, we'll say Tejas at lol.com, unread count is 250, and then we'll link my user here, okay. So this now, if we go back to bad table, we should still be able to choose, um, I think I may need to reload the page. Actually, no, it doesn't have an email column, right? Uh, I can, 
I can add a link column exactly to the email table um, and I'll call this email right and this this now properly implements to an F um, email dot email we, we can I think we can link this as well here so now this this properly implements to an F um, anyway back to spending too much time in this rabbit hole I apologize back to the slide um, what do we have all right so 3nf is the same as 2nf but no transitive dependency what is a transitive dependency well okay back to the laptop again um, a transitive dependency is when a, a column doesn't depend on the primary key but some other column so in this case here uh, we have pet type it really doesn't depend on the id of the user um, right it, it depends on the pet so again, this violates 3NF. How would we fix that? We would add a table called pets. Um, pets would have two columns, right? A pet, oops, a pet um, name and a pet type, right? Um, and then we would link bad table to pets. You, you kind of get the idea. So that's 3NF, uh, but let's, let's keep going. Um, and, and again, I probably won't do all for the sake of time, but just to get you rolling. Uh, BC, for example, yeah, BCNF is 3NF, but in a dependency, it's not primary to primary, but it's primary to always some secondary column. Um, 4NF is BCNF, but there's no multi-value dependency, and 5NF is, there's 4NF, but there's no join dependency. I think the join dependency in 5NF can be a bit complicated, so I will say this. Um, a good way to test for 5NF is if you decompose your table into smaller tables, like we kind of just did, um, do you lose any meaningful information and relations? And if you do, um, you're, you're violating 5 and F. Okay, so with that, let's continue. Uh, what, what a bunch of rabbit trails, I love it. All right, let's talk about NoSQL. Um, NoSQL is, has nothing to do with SQL. It's very different than SQL. Um, in fact, you can query some NoSQL databases with SQL. It's just a different paradigm, and, and, and I, I see a lot of people treating like NoSQL as if it's like some variant of SQL. Big mistake. It's very, it's fundamentally different by design. Uh, so, so let's look at how. So NoSQL. Um, on, on, your, on your left, you have what is a SQL database. It's usually one thing. On your right is what a NoSQL database looks like. A NoSQL database is usually always... Um, eventually spread across multiple servers, whereas a SQL database is usually one database per server. Um, and with a SQL database, you can have replicas, uh, but those would be separate servers too. The, it's, it's very, like NoSQL by its design can be fragmented and partitioned much better. You might be thinking, why is that? Why, why, does, why does NoSQL get this privilege of, of spreading across multiple computers by design and, and, and um, SQL doesn't. And it's because of rigidity and structure and normalization that NoSQL doesn't have. NoSQL databases are essentially key value stores. What does key value mean? Um, a key is a name, an identifier, and a value is, is a value to that name. So for example, an example of a key value um, type object about me is, is the key is name, the value is Tejas, right? Um, if, if we do an, like a collection, the key is favorite food, the value is lettuce, comma, chicken, comma, whatever. It's a collection. So the key is something and the value is the value of that something. Um, anyway, I hope, I hope that's helpful. I, but um, because it's just key value and there's no like tables, columns, relationships, normalization, whatever, you can very easily, um, you can very easily scale them across multiple, multiple, multiple computers even across thousands. In fact, if you look at this statistic here, um, Apple has a NoSQL database across about 75,000 plus servers. I think that is impressive. I think that's really impressive. Um, one more note about normalization, why it, was a, why it was a con in the last slide, was because it looking up stuff across linked tables and relationships and joins and stuff in SQL, takes time. It's expensive, it's slow, therefore it's a con. Anyway, um, so back to NoSQL. Apple has a big, big, big amount of NoSQL servers uh, for, for a database. And, you know, like we talked about ACID guarantees with SQL, um, NoSQL has a complement. It's called base. 
chemistry. You know what I'm saying? Uh, base stands for, it's basically available, meaning it's always available more or less, but your consistency will vary. Um, it's, it uses soft state, meaning consistency is, the state may not be accurate and it's eventually consistent. All three of these things in base mean the same thing. And that's a huge portion of NoSQL. Like, it's never accurate, it's all, maybe not all, never, but it's, it's, it's very rarely consistent with the latest state because um, writes keep happening to it really fast and replication is constantly happening. And, and you don't, it's very rare that you get the actual right number. Well, an example of NoSQL is probably something like uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter like likes and retweets these numbers, especially on like Elon Musk's, Musk's account. Whatever you're seeing, by the time you see it, is outdated because he's that popular. Right, so you always get inconsistent data, but this is a great use case for NoSQL. Um, and if you use SQL for this, you're going to have a really hard time handling that load. Anyway, so that's that's base. Um, let's come back now and talk about pros and cons of NoSQL. NoSQL, I mean, the biggest pro by far is it's easily distributed because it's a key value store. You can like use something called a partition key that decides um, at what point does this split off into another server. Does this database? server split off into another, and you can, using this partition key, very intelligently segregate your data across hundreds, thousands of servers, and each one receives like segregated load, so it's not overwhelmed by like a bunch of load at once, it scales better. Um, and I think that's, that's a huge, huge plus with NoSQL. Number two, it's the data is denormalized. Um, just like normalization was a con in, in SQL, denormalized data is a pro here, why? Because there's no expensive lookups, there's no joins, these things take time, you don't have that in NoSQL, therefore it's faster. Number three, um, lower cost. It's much cheaper to buy like 50 slow or cheap machines and put different um, NoSQL partitions on it instead of buying like one super powerful computer, right? So, or multiple super powerful computers. So because of that, it's actually much cheaper, all right? Cons, there is no standard language. Like SQL is beautiful, but NoSQL is the Wild West. Like you would use some query language in one NoSQL style database in Mongo, for example, in Cassandra, you'd use another. Um, collection means something in some languages, document. So it's not standardized and it can be hard to navigate. Number two, um, the data is inconsistent often by design. Uh, you're just gonna have to deal with that. But if it's something like retweet counts and like counts, it doesn't really matter. Again, it's about picking the right tool for the job. Um, and third, joins in relations. So if you have, uh, kind of like we just did, like like user users and email addresses, if you have two tables, in SQL, you can relate them by design. That's what SQL, SQL databases were made for. Um, in NoSQL, you'd have to get a user and then take their ID and then go to your emails uh, collection somewhere and find an email where the user ID, like it, it's complicated. and the, the database itself doesn't help you make this connection. You would have to know how to code in some language, JavaScript, TypeScript, Go, Rust, something to glue stuff together. And that's, I feel like a con because ideally it just gives you this out of the box. All right, that was the first of four problems. I know, uh, it's, it's been a while, it's, it's been quite a long time, but let's keep going and see um, see if we can still you know, do good here. Let's move on to number two. Number two is replication. Uh, replication is important at any level of scale, why? Because at some point, your one server is going to be overwhelmed. Like if you get really popular, I mean, think of YouTube, Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, like everybody replicates at some point, you have to. Um, you can replicate SQL and NoSQL, and that's kind of exactly what we're gonna talk about. Uh, we will spend more time on SQL replication because it's a bit more involved. With SQL replication, how it typically works is you have a main database and multiple replicas. Um, most applications tend to be read heavy, not all, but, but read heavy, meaning you read a lot. Like you have millions of people opening Instagram and looking at photos and you have fewer people posting, usually. A lot of people browse, fewer people post. Um, so for read heavy things, what you'll have is one main primary database where you send your write operations to to save data, and then like an army, like 50 plus 
even more um, replicas that are responsible for reading that you can load balance between. You can send reads to the one that's under the least amount of load, for example. So a primary and multiple read replicas is quite the common model. Um, there's multiple ways to do this though. Um, and, and what I'm about to do is break down some of the ways of replication in SQL, but um, some are specific to specific databases, like some will only be on MySQL, some will only be on Postgres. We'll try not to get into those details, but just kind of break down some of these, because chances are you've heard these words somewhere and maybe you didn't get them. So the goal of this whole thing is to eliminate imposter syndrome anyway. Uh, so with that, let's, let's go for it, let's go for it. So um, SQL replication. First kind of replication that I've, I've heard of is called statement replication. Uh, statement replication, how it works is you send a write or you send any operation to your um, primary database and what it'll do is it will, it will send the exact same SQL statement to the replica, which, which I think may not be ideal. And it may not be ideal because the statements are usually expensive to run. Like your chances are you're doing stuff um, and you're going to run them on your primary and then like your replicas are going to run them too. And your replicas may not be as powerful and so you may have problems. Um, yeah, you, you, you just don't want to run stuff twice on different machines. Um, so statement based, not so much for me. What else do we got? Binary replication. Now we're kind of talking because what binary replication entails is your primary gets a statement, executes a statement, gets the binary output for the statement, and then sends that to replicas. So the replicas don't do any um, executing of statements. They take the output and, and apply them, right? This is awesome, um, but the drawback I've seen maybe version mismatches. For example, if, if your primary is like Postgres 14 and you have some replicas, Postgres 12, Postgres 10, I don't know, um, binary output can differ, um, and then you run into consistency problems and maybe others. So not, not the best, um, but then there's also logical replication. And I think this is the best. Uh, you can even do this in a streamed way. But how it works is, I think, I think this is also exclusive to Postgres, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but it's the same as binary except it's wrapped with, with a bit more logic that can transcend version mismatches. And it's essentially the statement is executed, some logic is generated or exists, um, and it's applied across the replicas. It's quite cool. Um, in a sense, you could say it you know, the primary, in an oversimplified sense, you could say the primary says to the replicas, hey, someone changed X to Y, change X to Y. So it's instructions, essentially, that are streamed um, from, from somewhere. All right, and then synchronous. If we go back to CAP theorem, consistency, availability, partition tolerance. And maybe, you know, availability isn't so important to you, but consistency is. Um, and partition tolerance. In this setup, this is what synchronous replication will do. Um, how it works is your, your primary will receive a write, but it will not commit the write. It will then send this write to um, replicas and, and get an okay from them. Yes, I've written it, I've written it, I've written it, I've written it. And when all the replicas follow, the primary will commit and you'll get an okay. Um, and this is great because then you, you, you're guaranteed consistency. You're guaranteed that all the replicas and the primary are in the same place and, and you're good. This is very good for like financial apps and things where consistency is important. Um, lastly, bidirectional replication. I think this is the worst. Uh, the assumption here is you have not one main write uh, database, but multiple. And generally when you accept multiple writes anywhere, anytime, you're probably gonna have a bad time because conflict resolution, right? Like if you think about Google Docs, and you have like five people editing something, and the internet connections are not so stable, like you might have someone delete someone, delete something that someone just wrote. Um, that's bi-directional replication gives you these problems, which I just like, why? I don't, I don't really want that. Anyway, um, th that's SQL replication, but let's talk about no SQL replication. Look, by design, uh, it's kind of the same. You, you, you have the model of primary and multiple nodes in NoSQL, same way, and it actually maybe works better in NoSQL because it can be segregated like that more easily. Um, but you also have some NoSQL databases that would, like, and you can send a write to any node and they would reconcile the state within themselves. It's quite cool. Um, yeah, but effectively for all intents and purposes, it's similar if not the same. All right, let's talk about the next problem, the third one, which is data infrastructure. Data infrastructure. Now, across any org, 
it's not just databases usually. There, there's a lot more. And I think the best way to illustrate this is through a, a nice diagram. So if, if you'll come with me to the laptop, we're going to use an amazing tool that I like. It's called Excaladraw. Um, and I just want to model for you conversations I've had over and over and over again. And, and I've seen companies do this. So you, you start out with a database, whatever it may be, SQL, NoSQL, whatever. Um, you, you scale it up a, as you grow. You're like, okay, more RAM, more disk. Um, then you scale it horizontally. You add more databases, right? Um, and, and yeah, this is cool. And it works for a while. Everything's fine. But then you start to realize, oh, it's a bit slow. And it's a bit slow usually because you're reading uh, from and writing to disk. Um, so you think, okay, what can we do? Well, random access memory. RAM is, is faster by design. So maybe we can take some of the data that users need quickly and uh, put it in RAM. This is literally how computers work as well. Uh, so we'll take some of that and put it in RAM so that when people access it, they get it from RAM and it's super fast. And this is also how Twitter works. Um, that's how it's so fast when you get tweets and stuff. Um, so let's look at that. So it looks like this. Um, so you'll use something, some RAM-based situation. And how it works is your app will ask the RAM-based stuff for information in itself, in its cache, if it has any. If it has it, it gives it to the app instantly. This is called a cache hit. Um, but if it's cache miss, meaning if it asks our RAM-based thing, let's, um, ooh, what's happening here? Let's call RAM-based thing Redis. <laughs> Why not? Um, so if Redis doesn't have it, then it's a cache miss. It's going to ask the database for the data, um, get it, store it, send it back. This will take a bit more time, but only once. That's quite cool. Um, I, I need to, I need to, I need to pause here and tell you that Redis is amazing. Like I see a lot of people using Redis just as a cache. It is so much more than a cache. Like Redis is a full-fledged database and a pub sub engine. Man, let's. I think we should do a demo here. Let's uh, be quick. I promise. So look, um, I'm just so fascinated by this. So if we go to um, if we go to the terminal and we'll do docker run name tejas um, port, I, I don't, is it six, what is Redis default port? 6379. 6379 from my computer to 6379 in the, the image. Um, and I'll just do Redis. Oops. Oh, really? It's dash P? Okay. What? Port is already allocated. Am I running Redis already? Oh, okay. That's, uh, let's kill that one. Let's try this again. What? Container name Tejas is already in use? Uh, Fabienne, I don't know. Cool. So it's, it's running. It's ready to accept connections. Now, it's, it's, okay. Let's go here and Docker. What is it? Exec. Interactive terminal, I think. Um, and we'll do Redis and we'll run Redis CLI. I think this is all I need. No, right. It's called Fabian, of course. Okay, so I'm in Redis now, and I can easily like set thing to hello, right? And it's it's set. It's okay. So if I get thing, um, it's hello. But the cool thing is, if I um, kill Redis, if I just go like Docker stop Fabian right? It stopped it. And if I go here, look at this. DB saved on disk. Oof. Like Redis is a database. Like it, it had, look, it has durability. Um, and so, I mean, if I do Docker start Fabian, um, and if I, you know, run my same Docker, if I go to the CLI, if I get thing, it's still there. What? Um, so that's cool. And also I, I can do other stuff. I can be like, I can do pub sub. I can literally do pub sub. So I can, um, I, I will subscribe to a channel, subscribe to, I don't know, Tejas or Tej. So now I'm subscribed to this channel. And then in another Redis, um, I can, I can, where is it? Let's do Docker exec. Uh, again, same thing. TI, Fabian, uh, Redis, CLI. Right. So if I come here, I can actually uh, publish to the channel Tej sup. And one means true. And look, look, I, I, I got, I subscribed and I got a eh, Redis is kind of nuts. Anyway, I got reminded of Redis from this. Anyway, um, back, back to the data infrastructure. So, um, 
you have a database, you have replicas, you have Redis, but as you grow, you're going to grow so big that you're going to need some way to what? To search. Uh, every big thing in the world has search. I mean, Google, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Reddit. So you're, you're going to need search. So if we go back here, sorry, if we go back here, um, how do we do that? Uh, well, let's say we have some type of search, maybe Elasticsearch. And what we'll do is we'll need some way now to replicate the database from the database or the data rather from the database to the search engine. So we can talk to the search. A search engine essentially is a document store as well, right? That, that's, that's optimized for like relevancy and typo tolerance and stuff like that. Um, so we'll need a way to replicate data from the database to the search engine. Um, usually this is done with something called Kafka. Kafka is a stream processor by Apache. So your database will send data here, which will process the queue, the stream, streaming queue and send it here. And then everything's fine. Um, all of these are distributed as well, right? So anyway, um, you, you get the idea. So that is, this is also distributed. Everything's distributed. Just assume that. Okay. So that's the design and this looks complicated. Like imagine everybody having to set this up all the time. Data infrastructure is hard. This is why Zata exists. Like this thing I just showed you, this, this design here, um, this design is Zata under the hood, more or less. It's maybe a bit simplified. We, we do a bit more, but generally that's, that's it. Um, and so like, if you, if you want to talk about search, um, we actually have, like, we use the search engine in our own docs. If you go to docs.zata.io, like you, you do the search. Um, let's, let's quickly move on. I think we're over time. So if we go back to the slide deck, um, data infrastructure was hard. Last slide, the fourth problem, migrations. Migrations. Migrations are super hard database wise. Why? Because with migrations, you don't know. Um, oftentimes you don't know a lot. You don't know where to store them, Git repo, cloud somewhere. You don't know where to run them, how to test them. How do you deploy them without much downtime, without a migration window? The cost of messing up a migration is a cost that sometimes is way too high to bear. Um, and so, yeah, we, we need to really be careful around migrations. Um, I don't yet know the best way to do it. I'm sure there's many good ways, but this is also what we're trying to solve with Zata. Um, and I can, I can show you that uh, if, 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 you, if you're interested. So if we come back to the laptop, we can even do a migration probably on our table here. So if we come back to the laptop, um, this table, the, the bad table, the bad database, um, let's try and do something there. So what we're gonna do is go back here um, actually, do we want to? Yeah, let's go back here and we'll, we have something that changed. Let's just RMRF SADA. I think this is from some stale thing. Um, status. Yeah. Okay. Clean F. Okay. You know what? Let's just, okay. So now we'll init another Git repository. Um, and we'll, we have a main branch already. That's, that's cool. What we'll run is we'll run SADA in it and, um, do you want to create a new database? No, I want to use one NF. So I have this and I'm done. I literally have, if I open code, I have this database now locally with, with my bad table, with all the stuff as code. It's pretty nice. Um, but I noticed my bad table is quite bad because it doesn't allow people to have pronouns. So I can check out a new branch, um, a new branch, let's call it pro. And um, what we'll do is we will Zata deploy just to just to deploy this branch. Okay, the screen is up to date. Never mind. So we'll change the schema. We'll say we have a pronouns and it's a string. And now if we do Zata deploy, it's asking me do I want to add the column pronouns? Yes, I do. Um, great. I did a migration. Um, I think I should see it if I if I refresh. I, I don't see it. Oh, I do see it. Right, the pronouns. This is great. I'm going to commit this. Um, and it, Zara is seeing this as my default branch because I haven't really committed anything yet. Um, it's fine, it's my mistake, but let's make a new branch now and call it avatar. Um, new branch, let's add, instead of pronouns, we'll add, oopsie, we'll add avatar URL as a string. Zara deploy. Now that I have a new branch, database 1NF doesn't have a branch avatar, would you like to start a new branch? Yeah. From which branch should I fork the new branch? Uh, main. 
And so now it's forking this branch and it's now giving me a plan. Do you want to add column avatar URL? Yeah, I do. Done. So now if I come back here, I have a new branch avatar. And if I am in the bad table, notice the data, we had some data, right? If, if I go back to the main, um, there is some data. We don't copy data between branches for privacy. Um, so we do have this, this table. And if we look at avatar, we do have avatar URL here in this branch, but not in main. Um, at least hopefully not. Yeah, we don't. So we can evolve our schema this way in a safe way where the data is not copied and everything's cool. And in fact, I can even zata random data for the table bad table. Um, and it'll actually insert data here in this branch only to show me that this looks like a string. And I'm happy. And of course, the data is not shared between branches, so we're all good. And at some point, I can open a migration request. My team reviews it just like GitHub, merge, and then it goes to production safely. The migration that is run is a rolling deployment, meaning if we receive a query for the old schema, we translate it in real time to the new thing and apply it. Um, it's rolling and it's also zero downtime, meaning there is no like 503 service unavailable. It just works. Um, migrations are super hard and I haven't found an easy way to do them yet. Um, that's kind of why I help make this thing. Um, but let's, let's get back to the presentation. So, um, Let's talk takeaways. What do you do I want you to leave with today? Number one, databases are hard and really are not to be underestimated. I think that's super important. Um, wow, my slides are not having it today. Okay, there. Databases are hard. Um, there's a lot of complexity and it's very easy to get wrong. Like for example, in a NoSQL setup, if you set the wrong partition key, you have like 50 nodes with different partition keys and some nodes are way too oversaturated and others are not, it's very hard to change. Um, and really, if you're building like an app like YouTube about videos, you shouldn't have to deal with this. You should just focus on something that helps you upload videos. You know what I'm saying? Um, next topic, there are always trade-offs. I We get way too religious in the tech industry. Some people say, oh, I only use NoSQL or others say I only use Postgres and not MySQL and Vitesse is the worst. And like. No, um, all the tools, like even if they're like, especially because they're open source, in my opinion, all open source tools are a blessing. They're a free gift that someone gives. My goodness. Um, and really, there's trade-offs. I can tell you ways Zata is just not good. I can tell you ways Postgres is quite nice and ways that it's not. Like everything has trade-offs. One is not inherently better than the other, but it's about picking the right tool for the job. And number three, with databases, Safety is key. You really cannot afford to screw up a database because you the, the worst case, you lose data. Can you imagine showing up to like Instagram one day and your account just doesn't exist because someone was negligent and made a mistake? <gasps> but it has photos of mine from like 15 years. I know um, you want to be as safe as possible. And sometimes that means moving slow. But generally with databases, um, the safer you are, the better you are. And so I would encourage navigating these complex problems with a little bit of safety in order to create great databases and scale them well. With that, I want to say thank you so much for, for enduring. I know it's been long. I hope this has been helpful and uh, I'll catch you again soon in the next one. Peace. So this was a very in-depth talk by Dejas. And if you have any further questions, you can contact him. He put on the information on the last slide there.